So my name is Simon Brown. I'm doing this evening's presentation. So investing while junk, uh, because when I was lost here, we weren't junk. We were we were lovely, friendly people, and then things happened, and now we are officially. Well, so the point with junk is that it's deeply complicated. Firstly, we don't call it junk. We call it sub. Oops, sub investment grade. <laughs> Sub-investment grade doesn't fit on Twitter, so I use hashtag junk. So there are three global rating agencies. In fact, there are loads more, but those are the three that count. Uh, Fitch is the one that, that no one takes seriously of the three, but nonetheless. What have we got? S&P Global used to be called Standard & Poor's. Now I call themselves S&P Global. They do foreign debt and local debt, so they separate them out. And our foreign is junk and our local is good. Um, what that means is that part of our debt, now only about 10% of our government's debt is, is foreign denominated, mostly US dollar and euro, so it only really impacts a small portion of that debt. They are going to review us in June. The fact that they came out so very, very quickly uh, post the firing and did the change was a surprise uh, and also meant that they probably had the, everything ready just to hit the send button. In other words, they were probably going to downgrade us in June anyway. They just did it instead in, in, at the end of March in the process. Um, their review comes in June. Moody's at the time said they gave us a they will review, come back to us in 30 to 90 days. That is end of June. Sorry, the Moody's thing shouldn't be there, but there's nothing exciting hiding behind that. They are therefore coming back at the end of June, and they will tell us what our story is at that point there. And then Fitch panicked and just moved us straight into junk. Um, and, and called us junk status. Now there's debates out there about are you junk? Do you need to have two ratings as junk? Does it need to be low? Uh, it's all semantics. I'm going to touch on that in a moment. That is, then it just doesn't want to move at all. So that's the picture of how it looks. We've been junk before. Uh, th that's not quite representative because S&P has got our local above, but negative outlook, which means next step, if anything, will be down. Um, we are waiting on, on, on Moody's and Fitch has taken us down. If they use different scales because why make it simple? So broadly, we are sitting in what we call junk status. The, the question is, is, is how much does it really matter in the process? So what are the immediate implications for? In the first, there are the big fear is that, that, that some asset managers around the world cannot buy the bonds or the equity of countries that are in junk status, sub-investment grade. Um, and that is perfectly true. But there are also asset managers out there who specialize in buying junk status. There are some who don't mind. But certainly, our potential pool of investors is, a, is smaller. By what quantum is difficult to, 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 to fully get a grip on, but there are, less people, there are less asset managers out there who can buy our assets than could three months ago. And that's important because, you know, it's, it's about liquidity. It's about those buyers. So that's particularly important. What it does mean is that bond yields have moved higher. That's already happened. Um, it means the debt costs more. Now, the debt that exists does not cost more because that debt, the bond is issued, the rate has been done, and everything's cool. But new debt, understand that every single month, our government needs to go and issue bonds to keep the country running. Those bonds now cost more. At the moment, as of today, about 75 points, three quarters of a percent more um, every time. That's, that's not insignificant. That's the difference between eight and a half and nine and a quarter. That, that's almost a 10% difference in the term of, of what it costs. And that implication is long term. Some of this debt we're selling is 20 year debt, which means we're paying a higher interest bill for 20 years. So it's not just 2017, it runs all the way. Most of the debt is typically five, eight, maybe 10 years, but certainly there is some longer duration debt as well. That, of course, has implication for taxes. The government has, a, has an issue. They spend more than they earn, so they need to either reduce the amount that they're going to spend, unlikely. They therefore need to increase the amount that they earn, and they do that by increased taxes. And that's going to be, and we've seen that happening. That's not new. We saw it in the budget speech of February, the new tax brackets, the, the increase in capital gains tax, the increase in dividend withholding tax. Um, I think a lot of the taxes will be aimed at the higher income earners, that hence the new tax bracket at one and a half million and above. I do think there will be a lot in that space. At some point, I think the government may have to capitulate and look at VAT. 
They don't want to, of course, because VAT is much broader um, and much harder to justify. The point with VAT is it's a very easy, very efficient way of raising taxes. It really works seamlessly. And at 14% on global levels, we have a very, very low VAT rate. Most of Europe, Scandinavia is up in the 20s. Our 14% really, really, really is low. Um, now, I'm old enough to remember GST at 4%, which was what it was initially introduced. And then we switched to VAT, and it was 10%. And then one day, suddenly, I was actually living in Cape Town at the time. VAT went from 10 to 14% overnight. We haven't had a VAT increase in, in what, approaching, I mean, 20-plus years, approaching 30 years. I think they're going to have to do VAT sooner or later. Politically, it's going to be really, really tough. Um, but there's some processes there they can, they can try and take it there. Your banks get downgraded because a bank cannot have a higher rating than the sovereign. So it doesn't matter. Standard Bank, Ned Bank, et cetera, can do whatever they want. They can't have a higher rating than the country. So when the country goes down, they go down as well. That's just how it is. That has similar implications for the banks. It means that some uh, uh, asset managers can't buy them, can't buy their debt. It also means that their cost of borrowing is higher. So it puts strain on banks' balance sheets in terms of funding, uh, in terms of cost of money and all of that. So that does hurt the banks. It's not a train smash. Our banks are incredibly well capitalized. We have Basel III coming. It kicks in in 2019. Our banks are ahead of the requirements of Basel III, whereas many American and European banks are not yet ahead. And they don't need to. You've got two years to go. But Basel III has been in the works for six years, um, and our banks are ready. Our banks are capitalized. They're not, you know, they'll be fine, but it's a higher cost base for them. It pushes their cost base up. That hurts profits. If we're seeing tax increases at the same time, particularly if we see broad tax increases like that, that hurts their, their clients. We see bad debts start to rise. Now, our big banks locally have all been very aggressive and well, very cautious in who they're lending money to. So what we've seen is that the bad debt ratios and payments, as they call it, because no, I can, no one, impairment. I mean, it's, it actually sounds quite nice. Um, the impairments are actually at, re, at pretty good levels considering the stress the consumer's under. Um, and we can see it with, with Capitec and how they've been turning the taps off. They've been a lot more careful about who they lend money to and how much money. Part of that is good prudence from the bankers, and part of that is the National Credit Act. Now, the bankers hate the National Credit Act, but in truth, it's actually good for them because it means that their ability to loan is perhaps pulled back a bit, which means in the boom days, they'll make less money, but it means the bust days will be less bad. Potentially interest rates higher. This is a tricky one, and today we had our, our governor not increasing interest rates. Our inflation is relatively benign at the moment and will continue to be so for a simple reason. We're coming off a high base because of the drought last year. Okay, in Cape Town, you folks have no idea what rain looks like. I should have bought some pictures for you. Um, I would have bought some rain, but I would have got mugged at the airport as soon as I got off the plane. <clears throat> Interest rates in the next two to three years, I th you know, maybe they're up a percent if things go horribly wobbly. Otherwise, I think our interest rates, the problem is if interest rates go up, you take a, an economy that's struggling and you just strangle it. And, and that's the last thing you want to do. I think there's a real chance that maybe our interest rates actually just carry on sideways for a whole bunch. Um, but certainly inflation is benign and coming down. The CPI numbers yesterday were better than expected. The drivers around that is uh, rain, but also the drivers behind that is oil prices at current levels and the rand moving stronger. Um, the last thing in the world, I mean, if oil goes back to 100, we are in big dwang, but that's unlikely to happen. Oil around 50 is, is really, really good for us because it's a, it's, it's a huge inflationary impact in the process. So interest rates higher, maybe, but I'm not, I, I, I'm actually, I mean, when I'm looking at processes, I'm taking that out and saying, I'm actually just going to assume that interest rates are probably flat. And if they go higher, it'll be 25, maybe 50 basis points, but probably flat over the next two to three years, assuming there's no wheels falling off, you know, like really something horrendous happens. And that horrendous may be local, it may be offshore, it might be, you know, Donald Trump headbutts the Pope or something like that. Inflation higher? Uh, eventually, yes. In the short term, no. This year, inflation will continue down. Next year, inflation will continue down. The reasons for inflation continuing down is 
the wash through of the drought, is the strengthening of the rand, is the oil price staying around $50. So at this point in time, inflation is relatively benign. That's quite nice for consumers, of course. It's really nice for retail stocks because it gives them a bit of pricing power. And what I mean by that is when their tin of baked beans arrives and it's 4% more expensive than a year ago, they can make it 4.5% more expensive. And we don't really notice it. And that half percent, I mean, ShopRite only makes a 5.6% operating margin, pick and pay 2.2, that extra half percent for them is real. So in rising inflation, they get squeezed, but in falling inflation, they can expand their operating margins. So I expect pick and pay to, again, expand their margins a little bit. I expect uh, ShopRite to, again, expand their margins a little bit in the year and so going forward. That impact is already coming through, but will, as per the Pioneer results we saw, uh, as per the Tonga trading update, the real impact of, of the, the, the rain returning is felt now, but it really comes in in 2018. Um, then it becomes significantly more marked. And the reason is because a lot of these companies had uh, 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 hedges in place and all sorts of stuff. It takes time to wash through the systems in a sense. And that will start to happen. It's happening, but it's really going to kick through and be felt not in this year's results, but more in the, tw the results that are coming out sort of second half of 2018. And we'll see those coming through at the moment. Broadly, there's not very much in there that's good. I mean, we can pull out bits and pieces that are good, but I mean, really what you want is as many investors as possible and low bond yields and cheap debt and taxes going down and banks being upgraded and interest rates lower and inflation lower. Uh, and that's what we were having in the early 2000s, and that picture's now gone away. This is not a, a pretty picture at all. Um, it's not an immediate picture. There's a very important point that, that we need to understand. <clears throat> I'm going to touch on it a little bit now, and I'm going to come back to it in a lot more detail later in the presentation. Notwithstanding that there is a, you know, we can draw a line in the sand. It was about quarter past 11 on that Monday morning when we heard that Praveen Gordon had been recalled from London. Um, and then it was late on Thursday, um, or was it Wednesday evening, when the cabinet got shuffled, uh, Praveen Gordon uh, and co. were fired, et cetera, and so it goes. And then the downgrade just, you know, bang, bang, that came and hit us. We can draw a line in the sand there and say downgrade. But it's not binary in the investment world. You know, go back, you know, we saw this coming from 2015. I started positioning my portfolio and have done presentations around it, positioning my portfolio in 2015 for, for this eventuality hoping it wouldn't happen, but figuring my view has been there was more than a 50% chance that we would get downgraded to junk. That has been my view um, since December 2015. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not the smartest person in the room, so the other global investors will also position themselves. So there is an initial spark, but it's not a, a switch that gets flicked in a sense. It's a, it's a trend that plays. And, and that trend has been and is continuing to play out. It's a process that's going through. In our mind, it's like, you know, we were junk, we're not junk, you know. That, that's not how it really is. It's that process. The people who, who can't invest in junk bonds were already exiting from South African bonds because they don't want to have to suddenly head for the exit when it gets downgraded. So they were already unwinding positions and et cetera, et cetera. So it's very much more gradual rather than a binary. It, it flips. The point is, does it matter? Does junk status matter? In truth, no. It, and don't confuse junk and the economy, and I'm going to separate the two, and we will play them out. Junk status is, is it, it, it feels, it's not fun. I mean, it, you know, we're junk. I mean, there's no upside to that. Um, but in the, in, in, in the, I mean, in the bigger picture, it's, it, it's not the end of the world. We have been junk before. At the moment, the junk club is way bigger than any other club out there. I mean, heck, it, I mean, you know, uh, the, 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 the non-junk is, it's like, man, that's like a small party. This is where the real deal is. This is, it, it's a different, you know, if we go back to the 70s and 80s and the debt crisis, which was predominantly um, South America back then, um, and, and, and the issues around it and, and junk status destroyed economies for decades at a time. At this point now, junk status is just, yeah, it's one of those things. It's like, you know, do you invest in banks or retailers? You know, do you invest in junk or not junk? There are funds around the world controlling trillions of dollars that only invest in junk. 
They don't want, if, you, if you're not junk, they don't like you. They won't buy American debt because that's boring. They want junk debt. They want Brazil. They want South Africa. They want Peru and, 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 and Costa Rica and all of those sort of things like that. Um, so in many senses, it, 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 uh, you know, our economy was struggling. We were going to do what? 1%, maybe 1.5% growth this year at best. Now what are we going to do? Yeah, 1%. I mean, it's certainly taken a bit off, but it's not like we've suddenly gone off a cliff. Well, what we do have to is understand the distinction between the economy and the stock market. That is all economy. Me talking economy there. Stock market is a different kettle of fish in its entirety, and I'll get to that in a moment. The first thing we see is foreigners love our bonds. And how can we tell that? Well, two ways. One, because the JC publishes data telling us who's buying our bonds, and the foreigners have been buying it hand over fist. And secondly, our RAND is going stronger. What is, why does the RAND go stronger? Because before you can buy the bond, you have to buy the RAND. So they buy the RAND, buy the bond, and we can see that happening. Why? Because you're sitting in New York or wherever you might be sitting, and you can go and invest in a German bond at 0% or a Swedish bond at minus 2% or a Japanese bond at minus 1% or an American bond at 1%. And these are like, these are not returns. Or you can go buy a South African bond at 9%. And what the investor says, quite simply, is a risk-adjusted return. I get 9% yield. What is What do I think the chance of there being a default? Well, I think the chance is X, run the numbers, do the numbers add up. They do. Is South Africa, is our government likely to default on debt? No. If for own, if, okay, I mean, the, the main reason why you don't default on debt these days is you own the printing press. That's why Greece couldn't, because Greece doesn't own the printing press. That's the problem with the EU, is you don't own the printing press. In South Africa, if we want to repay a bond, no problem, boogie off to the printing press and run it until it, Runs out of ink or trees, whichever comes first, and and essentially pay off. Now I get I, inflation. Yes, I, I I I hear you about the inflation part, and that might be where 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 we start to see some higher inflation if we have to start printing that money. Um, governments typically don't default on on bonds anymore. Back in the day, they did. Debt crisis of seventy and eighty and and seventies and eighties. Yes. But these days, no, not so worried. And you know what? If you print money and your currency weakens, that's not a bad thing either. Countries around the world want weaker currencies. Weaker currencies are nice, you know, and, and so it goes and so on goes. You know, as much as we would hate 20 to the dollar, um, it would actually be quite nice for our economy because we've got a lot of mines that sell commodities in dollars, and that would bring a lot of rands into our economy and would help with trade balances and all of that sort of thing. So... The, the investors out there are quite keen on the 9%. And what they do is it really, I mean, so, so you sit in New York, you go and you, you borrow some money from a bank and you pay, what, half a percent of the money that you borrow. And you go and buy the South African bonds and you make 8.5%, you make 9%, so you've got an 8.5% spread. Um, and you hedge out the currency impact and that leaves you with maybe 6.5% guaranteed. In this low yield world, 6.5% is a monster number a monster number hence people are buying our bonds hands over fist junk or not there are some who can't but a bunch of them are simply buying our bonds um, and then of course risk on trade every so often I, the global economy goes risk on i don't want to go and buy boring american stocks they want some spice in their portfolio so where's your spice well it's africa it's russia it's turkey it's brazil and when you start looking at south africa russia turkey and brazil man we suddenly quite a shining example of proprietary. Um, you know, at least we haven't caught our president on tape doing corruption. We don't have a president who kills his opposition, and uh, we're not Turkey. We haven't just suspended the constitution and, 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 and made our president the supreme ruler of all that he can see. So of that, of that emerging market power, we're up around that top. This, this junk club, we're like one of the hip kids in the junk, junk club. Um, it's, I know it's a little weird. It takes a little bit of getting used to. But then, you know, I'm from Pantan and KZN. It's always been a little weird to get used to. <laughs> um, so it certainly isn't the end of the world. And here's our market. So here is when Nklanklanene gets fired. And yes, it's terrible and it's ugly. And remember January last year, January 2016? Remember Royal Bank of Scotland? Sell everything. Panic. And, well, apparently the only thing you should have sold was the Royal Bank of Scotland share price because literally everything went up. 
except the Royal Bank of Scotland share price. They got the memo wrong. They meant to say sell Royal Bank of Scotland. They did a small typo. So I mean, there's our market. Nene is fired, and that that I mean that was a that was terrible for a bunch of reasons. Firstly, it, it was bolt out the blue. Secondly, I did a presentation the evening before about what was going to happen in the year ahead, and the entire presentation got destroyed by that process. And thirdly, I was having my last event of the year. I'm at some place in, 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 in Johannesburg drinking vast amount of alcohol, and I get these messages, Nene is fired, and I'm like, that's not funny. But they just keep on coming, and eventually I check Bloomberg, and it's like, this is not a joke. He really, really has been fired. Anyway, we know what happened with there. The world ended, and then in January 2016, and then didn't end, and then off we boogied along, and then... Minister Gordon gets fired, and well, and we are now up 5% from that firing. We are just off, not today, we had some selling pressure yesterday and today, but on Monday of this week, our top 40 index hit the highest level it's ever hit in the history of our stock market. 48,300 and something points. Was it 49? Whatever it is. Uh, it's 40, 49,300 and some points. Highest level. So we haven't closed at a high, but we have intraday traded at an all-time high. And that, I mean, that tells you everything, right? And a bunch of you are shaking your heads and saying, this makes no sense. Well, welcome to stock markets. If stock markets made sense, we would all be so rich we would have bought Greece. <laughs> The point of stock markets is that they don't make sense. The hardest part of stock markets is understanding that they don't make sense and accepting that point and managing to engage within a process that makes a whole lot of no sense. It comes back to, is there return? What's critically happened in our market, I'll pass that, I'll get back to it in a moment. Um, but in essence, you can see that the market in the immediate doesn't like ministers being fired, but overall, yeah, who really cares? You know, am I gonna get a return? That's what matters. When I want to exit the position and convert my money back to whatever currency and take it home, will I be able to? I mean, you want to kill our stock market, you bring back exchange controls. That's the killer. You know, you bring back exchange controls, that market goes, I don't know where it goes, but it just, exchange controls kills it. Ministers, pra. market doesn't really care. So how long does this whole junk take? So, fortunately, we have a lot of examples of countries that have gone into junk, and we can see what happens and how they eventually get out of the process. Typically, five to seven years at best from when you become sub-investment grade until you are again investment grade. And that process initially is obviously downhill, and then you hit the bottom, and then you finally eke your way back up and get out. Uh, typically, the rating agencies are slow to put you back into investment grade because they don't want to be looking stupid like they all were in 2008. Um, and the crisis we had there. So it's, a, it, it's slow at the end. It's typically five to seven years, but it needn't be. It could be longer. It could be 20 years. There are countries that have never recovered from junk status, um, and you know, Zimbabwe and Afghanistan are, are certainly two of them. And we are neither Zimbabwe nor in Afghanistan. The economy, if we're at a economy is going to hurt for probably three to five years again, and then it turns and it slowly starts to come out again. The best benefits to our economy will be booming commodity prices. I don't see that. I think commodity prices are at best at their levels. They, some of them, you know, iron ore went to 90. That was too high. Iron ore's probably right at about 55 or 60. Oil's probably right at about 50. Um, platinum, uh, platinum's another whole kettle of fish. Platinum seems wrong at 1,000. So a quick side story, because I've been doing the research on platinum. Why is platinum under 1,000? Uh, the reason is quite simple, seemingly. It's about scrap, um, recycling of platinum. Now, a couple of things. 20 years ago, there were less cars with catalytic converters, so there was less demand, but there was less scrap. We've got those cars now all coming and being scrapped and getting into the process. So there's a lot more... Uh, uh, platinum and palladium coming for conversion, but there's a much more important point. You don't you don't scrap a car for the platinum or the palladium. You scrap a car for the steel. So when steel prices get to a certain level, what you see is you see cars being scrapped on a much higher basis, and therefore the platinum. What drives the steel price? Iron ore. So weirdly enough, watch iron ore to see where platinum is going. Unfortunately, iron ore has come back to 60 which means there's no hope for platinum. I mean, the short answer, the, the, the hope for platinum is that one of our three platinum mines closes down. Lonman, probably the one. If Lonman closes and that production is completely removed from the market, then we'll see prices. 
But as long as we've got current levels of production globally, so we pretty much own the platinum market. Russia pretty much owns the palladium market. And oddly enough, Sabanya is now going to be the biggest player in palladium by their still water acquisition. And I think Sabanya is going to buy Lonman. That rights issue they're currently doing, they're raising an extra four or five hundred million US dollars. What's the value of Lonman? Four or five hundred million US dollars. I think he's going to, because then what it'll, it'll give, what it'll give uh, 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 Neil Froman is it'll give him the platinum, because he's got, remember, those assets, the union assets from Anglo Platinum. You'll have Lonman, and then you'll have Palladium, which is still water. And it'll make Sabania the biggest producers of PGMs in the world. Now, we can argue whether you want to be the biggest producers of PGM. He might have chosen the wrong metal, but nonetheless, that's, but that's a complete, nap, that, that's an aside to the process. The economy hurts for three to five years, at best. It can be longer. And how much longer? Well, it can be forever and a day. You know, speak to North Koreans. Probably don't, you'll be arrested. But you get the sense of it. I mean, it, it, it's going to be a, a tough space. It is obviously going to, to my mind, the whole, it's going to hurt the poor. Yeah, you know what? Of course it's going to hurt the poor, but life hurts the poor. It is tough being poor. None of us, I mean, I, I take that back, not none of us. For many of us, it's impossibly difficult to imagine what it's like to actually be poor. And when I'm talking poor, I'm not talking, you know, your unemployed uh, layabout uh, brother-in-law. I'm talking about someone who's subsisting on government grants. You know, a pension of 1,440 rand a month. Um, that sort of thing. I mean, that is incomprehensible to me. You know, I, I, had, I, I have been poor in my life, but relatively, no. Not at all. No, not even close. Not even close. So, <coughs> hurts the poor. Where it really hurts, middle class, and where it really, really damages is the new middle class. The people who've just moved into the middle class. Why? Because they've slightly overextended themselves. They've bought a car. They've maybe got a flat that's a little too expensive, or perhaps they've bought, they've got a little too much debt. They've got too fancy a phone. Just buy a little bit. Just buy a little bit. And then things start to cost more, and maybe they lose their job, and they fall back out of the middle class. That's the risk. And it's a real risk. And the trick with it is, is that for the average person, your odds of getting from low to middle is pretty slim. But if you fall out, you never get back again. And that'll, that'll do, I mean, we've had an explosion in this country um, post-1994 of an expanding middle class. We are damaging that middle class. The question is, how badly do we damage it? And that has real implication, not just for individuals on the ground, which is obviously indeedly true, but just for the broader economy. The middle class is what drives an economy. The poor people, well, they drive ShopRite, and the rich people drive Richmond, but it's that middle economy which drives an, an, an economy. And that's our, big, that's our big risk that's sitting here, is those people who slightly went too far, and, and we don't blame them for it. That's what we would have done. It's what we did do. It's what we, you know, it's, it's what human nature is but you fall out the bottom again. And that's really, really rough. So it hurts for a while. Um, as I said, the, the, the Global Junk Club is big, but that is not as bad you want to necessarily put on your, on your, on, on, on your page. Um, what we need, forget the politicians, forget the, 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 all the bits like that. What we need is commodity prices, what we need is global economy to be doing okay. The global economy is doing well. We're starting to see Europe come to the party, which is useful because currently it's just been America and China. If we've got Europe, America, and China firing, and not firing on all cylinders, but you know, doing one and a half, two percent growth a year, five or six in China, that's three quarters of our global economy doing nice. Um, if we can get a couple of tailwinds around from the global space, that that can make it less painful for us, particularly in the commodity space. I'm just not convinced that commodities are, you know, if anything, they're probably happy where they are. I can't see them going up anymore. The demand isn't there. The demand that drove that commodity bubble up to 2007 and into 2010 was China. The point is China has done what they wanted to do. They have built a country, a country for a billion plus people. You know all those ghost cities you hear talk about in China? I mean, they're there. They're real. There are cities for 100, 150, 300, 500,000 people, an entire city, and no one lives there. But China's like saying, but that's not a problem because we've got, a, uh, we've, we've got 400 million people who live in the rural part of the world, and we're going to move them to the city. The point with infrastructure is you've got, in the ideal world, you build the infrastructure first. <laughs> 
You don't be retroactive and build it when you need it. You build it first. Look at kucha. Everyone thinks kucha is a white elephant. Right now, kucha is whatever it might be. But you build it first and then they will come. And of course, there's always a risk you build it and they don't. But China's got more power stations than they need, more apartments than they need, more fast trains than they need. But only because they've also got four, five hundred million people living in poverty. And understand that they have in the last 15 years taken half a billion people from poverty to middle class. And they're looking at the next half billion and saying, you're next. And they've built it. What they're now doing is shifting from an industrialization to a consumerization economy which means demand for commodities. And what happened was we just created capacity, so we've still got excess capacity. So I'm not massively bullish on commodities, but if they can stay where they are, that helps us. And it's why Iran didn't respond as badly this time as it did with Nene's firing, because the commodity prices are in a fight. Remember, when Nene got fired, Kumba was 25 rand. Last year, Kumba made 25 rand in profit, earnings per share. So this is a slide I took from my 2017 portfolio, uh, sorry, December 16, I do a, a presentation in the every year, position your portfolio for the year ahead, and I've just retaken the slide, and it's still all the same. My GDP, I'm not looking 2% <coughs> at best, frankly, one and, one and a half at this point in the equation. Um, I'm bullish on top 40, I'll come to that in a second. Um, my, my question was, is the bad news all in? Well, hey, we can always be naive. The thing being is that, generally to the market, is that the firing of... So, so what did December 2015 teach us in the firing of Minister Nene? That President Zuma wants to capture the Treasury. Told us that blatantly played his hand. Did we really think that he had like been slapped down and was now going to go sit in the corner and stop trying to catch the, the Treasury? No. We knew he was going to try. We just didn't know when or how. Now we know. And the debate is, you know... We, the levels of capture, blah, 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 not important. That, that, that was his thing. So in a sense, the bad, the bad news is that, that he wanted to capture the Treasury, not that he succeeded in doing it. We knew he wanted to do it. We knew he had the power and the ability because he can hire and fire a cabinet ministers at his will, and he's shown us that he does. But a couple of things. That three-year, and this chart is now out of date because it was from end of last year. We're now sitting up at that level up there at the highs. Markets correct two ways. They correct by crashing, which is what we saw in 2008, 2009, and they crash and markets then go from expensive to cheap, and then everyone loves them and they buy them. There's a second way markets correct. They correct in time. They go sideways. And what happens while they go sideways is that the profits of those companies that make up the market increase, and essentially you get a correction in time. So what's happened over that period is that our market has gone sideways for pretty much exactly three years. And during that time, the profits of those top 40 companies has probably increased 30 or 40%, not annualized, in total. So let's take 35% as our mid-range. If over the last three years, the profits of our top 40 companies have increased 35%, which is about 9% annualized and compounded, that means that our market has effectively corrected 35%. Our market is 35% cheaper than it was three years ago. Now, there is a skew to the PE on the market, and that is NASPAS. NASPAS is 17% of our index and sits in a PE of 100. But if you remove NASPAS from the equation, our market is only slightly more expensive than it was in March 2009 at the end of the great crisis. We have corrected in time. Now, personally, I prefer a correction in price just because it makes for fun headlines. But in truth, the correction in price is terrible because it drives people away. If we were sitting here today and our market had just collapsed 50%, half of you wouldn't be here. Because it was like, Hoy, I ain't going anywhere near that thing. You're feeling poorer. You are poorer. You're feeling battered. You hate. You wish you'd never heard of the JSC and Simon Brown. Whereas the three-year sideways correction just feels a little icky. You know, it's like showering with salt water. It's not quite rewarding. It's better than nothing, but not quite the perfect thing. Half of you have never showered in salt water. You even live by the sea. Anyway, and that's the key thesis for my saying we're going higher. And I don't think that the downgrades, I'm not seeing, there's no evidence, and I go back to this chart here, there's no evidence that the downgrades has changed that picture. I don't think all of that there changes necessarily the picture, certainly not in the next couple of years. And again, it comes back to the distinction between the market and the economy. We think they won, they're not. Take that top 40. 
The top 40 is 75% of the earnings come from beyond the borders of our country. Richmond, Breit, Steinhoff, British American Tobacco, NASPAS, ShopRite is 30% earnings from Africa, Woolies will be 50% earnings from Australia, and so on and so on and so on. Our top 40 is a global index. Our mid-cap index, haha, that is local. We'll talk about them in a second. So I, that was my presentation on 8 December last year, and I, NASPAS remains the risk. If, 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 10, if, if 10 cent goes off a cliff, NASPAS goes off a cliff, it's 17% of our index, we go off a cliff. Um, excuse me, and it's why when I buy the ETFs, I don't buy the Satrix 40, I buy the core shares equal weighted. Because the top 40 will go off a cliff, but the equal weight will only bump in the road because NASPAS is only 2.5 rather than 17. I don't want 17% exposure to anything. And NASPAS has been a great stock to have it, but I mean, to me, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a problem with the index. It is what it is, but it, yeah. So I remain bullish in the process. I still think that, that and, and I was having the argument on Twitter today, and I keep on having it with people, and so far I'm right, and I'll touch wood and admit that today's only 25th of May, um, but we are green year to date for our market. I know. It boggles the brain, but we are green year to date for this market. And next, I mean, what can happen worse than has happened already? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not. This is not rhetorical. If people have good ideas, I, what can what what can happen to our economy? What can happen to the global economy that is worse than has happened in the last year? Remember last year, Brexit, <laughs> end of the world, FTSE 100 trading at all-time highs, Trump. End of the world, S&P 500 trading at all-time highs. Le Pen got completely pasted. The fact that she got to the second round, yeah, yeah, yeah. But so I don't know what happens that crashes. So, so typically what happens, crashes never come from where you expect. That's the first important lesson. And our biggest risk, I think, is not internal. I think our biggest risk is external. Take a scenario, and I'm just playing things through here. Let's say that uh, Trump shoots Hillary Clinton, and that would surely be an impeachable offense, right? They'd have to impeach him for that. I mean, I, don't know, I know they don't like Hillary Clinton, but that's surely a line too far. So they impeach Hillary Clinton. Uh, sorry, Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton's dead. Um, I mean, maybe that would crash an American market. I mean, I wouldn't. I mean, it might not. In fact, that might. Actually, the market will go up, hey? Um, <laughs> let's say they make Trump president for life. Ah, he suspends the American Constitution and makes himself president for life. And the American market nose dives and loses 30 or 40 percent. We will follow. Yes, we are tied to global markets. But as long as global markets can remain stable to upwards, they're doing fine and they will drag us along with them and we will go quite fine and happily into it. Um, this, again, is just a slide I grabbed. One of the key points for us, and it's, it's, it's the savior, that not that droughts are good, but having gone through the drought and with the rest of the country having loads amount of rain, um, and I mean loads amount. We had more rain this summer in Joburg than we've had in the 10 years I lived there, um, is having a massive savior for us. And that is bringing down food prices. It's bringing down inflation. It's going to help some of the local stocks. The, the, the return of the rain is a big deal for us. And really nicely timed in a sense, and completely, of course, beyond our hands. And I'm sure there are politicians who are claiming responsibility for the rain. Um, and they're welcome to it. I don't really care who wants to take the, 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 the kudos for it. We, this, is, this, is, this is a huge savior for us as an economy and to a degree as a market. Absolutely it is. It's a big deal for us that it's coming back. And here's Brazil. As I said, I mean, you know, we think it's tough being South African. You should try to be Brazilian. Um, so they, they've they impeached one president. They're about to impeach a second president, perhaps. Um, and that was the drop there when he got caught on tape. So we go back to 2015. They get downgraded and downgraded and downgraded and downgraded and impeached. And that market is up more than 50% since they were downgraded. Their currency has strengthened more than 35% since the downgrades. And they are fully downgraded. We are only kiddie. They, they got hit twice by S&P, and Fitch and Moody's all took them to junk. They are junk across the board, 
and their stock market's up 50%. They also had the correction in time. That's why I've given you more background in the chart. And in fact, you can go back another two years. They had about a four year where the market broadly went sideways. Their range was quite big. Their range was bigger than ours. Our range has been about a 15% sideways range. Theirs was closer to about 25. But they corrected in time. They went to junk. And now they're up 50%. And that's after their president got caught in tape. This chart is from 19th, which was Monday. No? Ah, in the past. I can't remember what today is. South Korea, same story. Colombia, same story. Chile, different story. Chile got downgraded, bottom fell out of the market. But in many cases, it's not the end of the world. It's what I was saying. And it, it, it just, this is just supporting argument to the theme. That the bullish, to my, to my mind, there's a bullish case to be made for our market. I want to stress, and I'm going to come back to it. I'm not saying that we go out there and put granny's pension into the market. I'm not saying that we sell everything we own and stick it into the market and then we take debt. All I'm saying is don't panic and, and don't go rushing to the hills and don't think the world is ending. <coughs> course if it doesn't rain. What is the plan for Cape Town if it doesn't ever rain again? I got a, hey, hey, I got a five bedroom house I'm selling. Anyone? Somebody? Come on. Why don't you all club together? Five rooms. You can. I did a whole podcast on it. If you want to go just one lap.com slash JC direct. I did a whole podcast on pulling apart Brazil in particular, but the other markets as well. Typically what we find, and, and I, I put Brazil there because we could call South Korea a different story. What we have seen is some countries come back very quickly. Ireland, three years from junk to, 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 to back to investment grade. Ireland, we can argue is a different kettle of fish, EU, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Colombia uh, took seven years. Uh, South Korea took five years. Um, these are kind of, you know, we're kind of, we might not be South Korea. We probably, we certainly, I think we think we're better than Colombia, although they make coffee, which is not unimportant. Um, but, but we look around, we're in that zone of space. A very, very important point. Politicians are less important than you think. It's more about economies are cyclical. And, and, you know, we, we have, we've had booms in our economies that, that, that we certainly don't want to credit to the politicians. And we've had crashes in our economy that we don't want, you know, is, is it fair to blame the crash of 08 on Tabo and Becky, uh, whoever was the prime minister in the UK, and uh, W. Bush? I mean, it's fun, but it might not necessarily be fair. Politicians have a lot less influence, and they can touch direct things, and they can sh cause short-term panics. But when economies are in a trend, man, it's like a train, and you don't just sort of say, hey, stop. It's, it's going. It's on a move. The trick with our economy is that that trend is, A, not very steep, and it is incredibly slow. So how do we manage? What are we doing? So there's the background. What do we practically do with this to, to come out the other side uh, in good, solid shape and, 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 and wealthier and, and better off for it? So firstly, from a personal perspective, you don't panic. You never panic. You never, ever panic. Panic is never good. Um, so simple stuff like just get rid of debt and liabilities. Uh, just just, uh, just yeah, batten down the hatches. If you typically drink 10-year-old wine, start drinking 6-year-old wine. If you have lobster three times a week, start having it twice a week. If you normally drink Verve Clicquot, maybe try one of the MCCs. They're quite lacquer. You know, just, just batten it down a bit. Just make it, you know, I, I, and, and this is not for everyone, but I talk about something called lifestyle creep. Um, and it's why I'm selling my house and I've bought a one-bedroom apartment because really, why do I need, 380 square meters to live in. I mean, for what? Um, little things, just, you know, you sign up for this, you sign up. At the end of last year, I went through my bank statement and just found all these services I subscribed to. And, okay, some of them were work-related, but so excluding the work-related ones, I removed $350 a month of expenses. $10 here, $20 there, $5 here, just all over the place. Just little flittery things that at the time when you sign up, you think, oh, $20 a month. Well, that's not too bad. You know, and $5 here, and that was $350. In total, I took out $1,000 of expenses. 
650 for work, 350 in my personal space. So just go and get aggressive with, with costs. It's my phone that will go away in a moment. Get aggressive with costs. Get very aggressive with debt. Don't go jump into new debt. Don't go buy that new 12-bedroom house in Camps Bay, even though it's cheap. Um, don't go buy the new Audi R8 or is it Audi R8? Whatever they are, whatever. You know, just be, be sensible. It's going to be tough in the economy out there. We're all going to be vulnerable to varying degrees. Let's reduce our vulnerability in that sense. Um, focus, as always, on assets. Assets are lovely things. They pay you money. That's what we always want, more assets, less liabilities, nothing particularly there. Position yourself for low growth, for inflation if it comes back, and for interest rates. Inflation and interest rates might not come back, but if you position for them and they don't, well, then boom, boom, we're winning. There's, nothing, there's, no, down, there's no downside to making your personal balance sheet look better. There's only upside. And then your portfolio. So the first thing is this should have been a process and should have started December 15, but nonetheless, get rid of second rate shares. Those shares that you're never quite sure and mostly it's hope and, and the evidence has been slim. Um, it's time to get rid of them. It's time to say it's been real. You know, read this, the, 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 in, in booming markets, in booming markets, coupled with booming economies, man, every dog will have its day. In this type of environment, but the market will be moving higher, but the underpinning economy will be will be fragile, and the the the, the confidence levels will be low. Second rate shares are not the place you want to put your cash. And I'm going to talk smaller mids in a moment. Um, we want high quality, high quality companies with lots of offshore and lots of sustainable, sustainable earnings. In other words, not cyclical. In other words, not miners, not construction companies, not those boom and bust guys. <clears throat> so, things such as uh, <clears throat> low LSM food retailers, people have to eat. And if times are tough, the people at Woolies start shopping at ShopRite. Because you know what? Steak is steak, hey? So, <clears throat> position it in that sense. Get smart in that place. Avoid local GDP-dependent stocks. We were talking value. Value is a brilliant company. They had a spectacular bit of, uh, set of results. They have transformed that business um, the stock is, I think, up 25% on the day of the results. It, it still, at that point, was trading below tangible net asset value. But I wouldn't touch it. Because even the management say, man, it is tough out there. There's a lot of price competition for, for business. So you've got to cut your prices, which hurts your margin. Or you walk away from the business if you don't want to cut your price. And therefore, you, you, know, you lose revenue and your head office costs hurt and that sort of thing. <clears throat> Great company, great everything, but logistics in our economy, mm. Santova is slightly different. Why? Because 64% offshore. Talking about book, Asterix, I own Santova. 64% um, of their earnings offshore. That's what we're looking for. Uh, and always keep some cash. I'm always a fan of keeping some cash, but in this space, cash is paying, cash is worthy of having it. Small and mid caps. <clears throat> So smaller mid caps have not got ugly, but they could still get ugly. And what I mean by ugly is that, I mean, what happens here in your smaller mid caps is that liquidity disappears. The buyers disappear, and then the sellers arrive. So suddenly the buyers all went home, and suddenly the sellers all arrived, and those share prices collapsed. If you were around in 2008, 2009, and you owned any small cap stocks, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it doesn't matter who they are, or what they do, or how they do it. Sellers just arrive and say, I just want out. Don't care. Just want out. And the buyers have disappeared. Because what I'm saying here, which is... So the thing with your smaller mid-caps is they're typically more local stocks, right? They, they're much more dependent. So there are exceptions, and Santova is one of them, where they have a lot of exposure globally. But most small caps, excuse me, are small. Their business is typically localized within the country. Their customers are typically localized within the country. If our economy is struggling, they will struggle. The top 40 is 75% offshore earnings. The mid cap, which is stocks 41 to 100, and I don't know the exact number, but I would estimate it's probably 10 or 15% of offshore earnings. Whole different game. And their customer base is going to struggle. They're going to lose some customers. 
one or two big customers might go bust, might come to them and say, we want to be your customer, but we need a much better price. Please, can you, you know, whatever the deal is, and so on and so on. And the liquidity just disappears. And don't think that you can hold your way through it. There are small cap stocks today that still haven't recovered from the 08 crisis. Lots of them. Some have. Supergroup. Uh, One Logistics. Santova and others, but bunches of them haven't. Look at all of the all of the bankruptcies we've had on the JSC. Aside from African Bank, which by the time it went bankrupt was a small cap, but it had been in the top 40 at one point, um, we had no top 40 companies go bust in the crisis of 08 or 09. We haven't had a our last top 40 bankruptcy was LeisureNet. 2002, three. Okay, I can see some of you also held LeisureNet. Eh? I got my fingers, but I tell you it was close. <laughs> um, but we've had a lot of companies hit the wall. And they've all been in that smaller mid-cap space. So there's two ways we do and And also, I sit on Keith McLaughlin's investment committee, and it's tough. It is tough. Not for me, because I just go there for the, you know, I just, I go, you know, they, they feed me food and coffee, and I get to chirp. But it's tough for him because he's got to try and find these stocks, and they're brilliant, and they're just going down and down and down. And it's it's a tough space to be in. It's an immensely tough space, and it's not just him. You look at the funds in, in, in that space. The small cap funds are struggling, and and our best thing is so I got rid of most of mine back in December of 15 and January of 2016. Um, I have left Santova. <sighs> which is a small enough position to not keep me awake at night. The stock is doing terrible. I also, to be honest, have an average entry price in Centover, I think, of 92 cents. So even at three rand and change, it's looking pretty. Um, and they've got 64% offshore earnings. What else do I have? I have some Sea Harvest, um, and I have some Tongart. I'll touch on them in a moment. And I have some Colgrey M3s. My average price in Colgrey M3 is about two rand fifty. Um, and that last set of results did not thrill me. But I sold 80% of my cold grows in December of 2015. So, again, a very small position. So, take a strong, hard look at your big stocks, quality, offshore, sustainable. And in your small caps, a double strong, hard look. So, some practically... Big banks, I don't like them. Capitex, my exception. And I know that that intuitively makes no sense because bad debts are rising and everything. But it's very hard to sell a stock that you paid 20 Rand for and is now 768 trillion Rand. You know, it's like there's few things I love in my life. Eh? Chocolate, coffee, wine, Capitex. It's a 35 bagger, the, no, 37 bagger last time I checked. I mean, you know, it breaks my heart. And I did. I sold half my Capitex back in December 2015. Um, and Capitex is different because of cost structures, and you can see them turning off the taps. You can see them being a lot more careful about lending money. If it goes horrible, their results will hurt, and their prices will come down markedly, their, their share price as with their profit. Um, but if, if, if we don't hit a wall and we just carry on struggling, Capitec will do just fine. The big banks, however, have got cost issues around them, their cost of capital, as I said up front. I don't like the big banks. I know they've done very well last year with, with the space to be, and I was completely wrong because back in December 15, I was saying stay away from the big banks. I just don't like them. The valuations are attractive. But when I look five years forward, I don't know what's going to – so in five years, you should double your growth, right? If you do 15% a year compounded, in five years, you double your growth. I don't see how ABSA – Nedbank, Standard Bank, FNB, I don't see how they double their growth in five years. I see how they double their costs, but I don't see how their growth doubles. <clears throat> um, retailers, stay away except for low LSM food retailer. And if you know anything about me, that is ShopRite. I have some Woolies. In fact, I have far too much Woolies because I think Woolies is the cheapest share in the top 40 right now um, on my valuation metrics. So I have a truckload of it. Um, and I'm holding my breath. They're going to hurt in South Africa. The problem with Australia is that, you know, there's a simple rule out there, hey? Mergers and acquisitions take longer, cost more, and give less synergies. Management will always tell you it will be three years, it will double payment, and the synergies will be great. Lie, lie, lie. Oh, and they overpay. Lie. They always overpay. 
Of course they overpay. They went to market and paid a 30% premium. That, in my book, is called overpaying. By how much? 30%. Just by the by. So, so Woolies is, I think, I mean, my value on Woolies is, is 90-ish rand, 88 rand. You can pick it up today at 67. But I'm not picking up any. I've got so many Woolies, I'm almost going to get a board seat. And then, no, no, that's going to be so cool. You know what? I bet at the board meeting, I bet they serve chuckles. Man, I love chuckles. Um, clothing retail, stay away. If nothing else, I've been staying away from clothing retail for 100 years. Why? Because H&M and Zara and Cotton On are killing our retailers. Not because we don't have brilliant retailers, and we do. Our retail management in this country is, is, is in some cases, the best in the world. And if they're not the best, they're as good as the best. But they've suddenly got serious competition coming from multiple angles, and they are struggling. And this is not a place where you want to go jump in. Local defensives, I mean, your most defensive stock in the world is Metrofile. Now, Metrofile will struggle. Why? Because some of their businesses will go bankrupt, and some of their clients will have less paper to be filed. But the point is, you have to, by law, keep those documents for five or seven years, depending on what they are. And you don't give them to me to store. You give them to someone you trust. And Metrofile market share in South Africa are about 62%. I mean, they are the dominant player in the space. Um, and a, a, a dividend yield, the other day they were down at four rand, which was putting them on a dividend yield of eight and a bit. Now, I like cash because I have habits, and an eight and a bit dividend yield is quite very, very chunky. I expect Metrofile's earnings to going forward for the, this financial year to probably be flat. I expect their dividend to probably be flat as well. Um, but that's fine. I can, you know, I'm happy. It, for my fair value of Metrofile, for me, is around 460, 470, or there's about. The, themed, the theme is rain. Anthony Clark was here a few months ago talking about his theme, and it was rain. Whether you're picking Astral, whether you're picking Pioneer Foods, whether you're picking Tongart, which is mine in the space, the, 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 the return of the rain is having a significant impact. And it's coming through slowly. The update from Tongart told us quite clearly that sugar did incredibly well, but not on increased production, on increased price. Uh, starch was hurt because of the cost of maize still filtering through, and land was disappointing, but land is always lumpy. So what's going to happen with Tongart is that in this financial full year, and then into their full year of 2018, their production will probably increase 60 or 70 percent in terms of sugar, and their starch costs will come down because one of their big inputs is obviously your maizes and your wheats, and that will then come down and wash through. My target price for, for Tonga is 160, 170. Currently trading about 118. When I checked this morning, my profit on Tonga was exactly 31 rand. Don't spend it all at once. Resource stocks, if anything, are commodity specific. I just look, I don't like resource stocks. I, I, I stay away from them. I, I, I leave them where they are. They can you know, do as they wish. I, I stay away from, from, from the resource stocks. I have some bulletins, legacy. I haven't added to my bulletin position since late 2007, if I recall correctly. So 10 years since I've added to bulletin. I have Sassel, and I have added some. If you want to buy Sassel, 360 is your price on Sassel. There's a key point, and I don't have a chart, but I've talked about it before. Our RAND is going stronger. Now, that's counterintuitive to buy the offshores. Excuse me. But the offshores <clears throat> with the stronger RAND will be fine because their costs are RAND-based. Um, and it'll, it'll wash through and it will hurt them a bit in the short term. In time, it will go efficiencies. So your BTIs and your Richmonds and stuff are fine. Um, where the RAND going stronger is going to hurt is your resource stocks. And why does the RAND go stronger? Simple reason. People are buying our bonds. And if I'm right about a market moving higher, people are buying our equity. I've, I, I've got, I mean, to my mind, the RAND is going sub-12 and might even go sub-11. And this will play out over the next two or three years. But don't bet your, don't position yourself for a RAND going to 18. It'll go to 18. But I think it might go to 10.50 first and then go to 18. So short version, uh, your ETS and your tax-free, as long as they're not complicated little things as they were. We carry on doing it. It's long term. We no stress there at all. So short version, it's going to be tough for the economy. I'm not stressed for the market. 
stay away from small caps, stay away from local GDP, stay away from mid caps. Focus on quality. And it's intuitive. You say you always focus on quality. No, 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 no. In, in booming bull markets, you don't buy quality. You buy anything that moves. In this market, we only buy quality. In 1999, you just bought it. In 2006 and 7, you just bought it. It didn't matter what it was. In this market, it matters what it is. Stock pickers market. I hate the phrase, but it kind of fits. Um, so it's going to be messy, but it's not the end of the world. I still say stronger rand, higher market. And then at some point, the rand will turn again, and that will add extra impetus to our market. I expect us to get more downgrades from S&P, from Fitch, from Moody's, from everyone else. I expect the rest of the world to say, yeah, could be worse. You could be Turkey. Uh, legal stuff, as always. <laughs> <laughs> I've hit my time. So I started two minutes late, so I ran two minutes late. Um, I'll take... Okay, let's end it now. If folks are under time pressure, you're welcome to leave. But if folks want to quickly do specific stocks, I'll take specific stocks. I'll give you my Twitter answers. Uh, I preface all of that by saying quite simply, my view, and I'm wrong often enough. I'm right sometimes too. Um, but just because I say it doesn't make it true. You have an airplane to catch, so you might want to run. <laughs> Ladies and gents, thanks very much.